If, if you took a class with me, you know I talk really fast. And I'm going to try and go through like 168 slides in, in, in one hour. So, so fasten your seat belts and, and don't, don't, don't blink. So uh, I used to study financial history back in the day. And I used to love to go around and take a look at all these old bank buildings. Like I grew up in Philadelphia. And we had the first bank of the US, second bank of the US. And they're so imposing. And they're meant to look imposing because they're meant to look like they last forever. OK, so on the left, we have Mellon Bank. In, in Philadelphia. On the right, we have Wells Fargo uh, Bank here in San Francisco. Don't they look like they're going to last forever? And so a lot of other companies wanted to imitate this architecture to convey the message of permanence. One such company was Borders Bookstore. <laughs> okay? And you know, you look at this, you think, wow, that looks pretty imposing. And then you look down here, and it's final days, right? I mean, who could have imagined that the bookstore would disappear from our lives? I used to spend literally eight hours a week in bookstores until 1998, when Amazon was created. And it went from eight hours to zero overnight, right? And so a lot of people think the banks will never die. They have franchises. They have government regulation to protect them. But a lot of people also thought the bookstores would never die. And of course, they have completely almost vanished from our lives. Now, of course, banking is a little bit different. And so this is the question that we're going to try and answer. Because of all the innovation in finance, you can see the massive run-up in investment in fintech. And this is VC investment in fintech startups. Now, this is a small percentage of the investment because, of course, all of the legacy banking institutions are also heavily, aggressively investing in, in technology in order to transform their businesses. But look out, banks. Every single piece of functionality that you currently do well, from mortgages to payments to credit provisioning right to checking to payments, they are all under attack from all of these individual startups. Okay, And so the future is, for me, Fascinating as a financial historian, I love watching this history unfold in real time. If you like European banks, we've got one of those too. OK, so I'm going to borrow from the World Economic Forum. Uh, they came up with this nifty diagram which walks through all of the different sectors of finance that are being transformed by technology. And so we're going to try and go through all of these, if we can, as quickly as possible. And if you want to go deeper, we can go deeper, You know, figure out a way to come back to Haas and continue your, your education. Right? So let's start with deposits and, and lending. Let's go back in time a little bit to the 19, uh, 1980s, I think it was, 19, early 1990s, there was this bank called Signet Bank. Okay? And this was the 350th largest bank in the United States. How did they go from being the 350th largest bank in the US to being the largest credit card issuer in the world in a very short period of time? How did they do this? How did they grow? their business so dramatically and so quickly. One guess, big data, OK? Big data. Now, look, what have lenders been doing? Lenders have been using data forever. Look, finance is an information-intensive business. It's all about information. If you studied finance, you know about adverse selection. You know about asymmetric information. You know about delegated monitoring, right? It's all about information. Whoever has the best information wins. So what were all these credit card companies doing up until the early 90s? Right? They were all relying more or less on the same credit metric, credit scoring model, which came from Fair Isaacs, FICO, or something similar, right, from Equifax or, or from TransUnion, okay, which took in a whole bunch of different characteristics of all the different borrowers, okay, and then you know, came up with some predictive uh, model. Now, this is data science. Now, we call it data science now, but people have been doing this forever. If you've used a spreadsheet and done a regression, well, then count yourself a data scientist. I now <laughs> knight you, right, data scientist, all right? You've done it. Because all you're doing is you're taking a whole bunch of customers in your training data, right? And those are the rows. And then you have all these characteristics of the customers that are sitting in columns, like you know, outstanding balance, number of cards, number of times you paid late, et cetera. Okay? And, and then right, with that data, you then track the customer forward and look to see whether or not they default on a loan or fail to make a payment. And that's all the FICO score is, is doing. 
right? So if that's what they were doing then, and that's what they're doing now, what has fundamentally changed? And this is it, right? So if anybody asks you, if you were here last year, you learned this as well, or the year before, if anybody asks you what data science is, it's training and scoring. Give me some historical data, train a model on it, use that model to score new data, and come up with a prediction about somebody's future behavior. Okay, very, very simple. You get the bottom row, and then you guess what fills in the final column, which is the target feature. Super, super easy, lots of different methods. Okay, I could teach you in an afternoon how to do this sort of thing. Okay, so what has changed? What has changed is the volume of data, okay, the number of rows, and also the number of columns, the kinds of things that we know about our customers. Okay, now what Capital One did is add a whole bunch of rows. So previously, all of the other credit card companies simply refused to lend money to anyone whose FICO score was below a certain cutoff. And so Capital One said, <clears throat> You know, we're guessing there are some diamonds in the rough. We're guessing that some of these people who have never gotten credit are probably good for it. But we'll never know unless we actually give them credit. So they designed an experiment where they just blasted out credit cards to all of these supposed deadbeats. And, and guess what happened? Most of them were deadbeats. OK, there was a reason why <laughs> the banks weren't lending to these people. Okay, there was a reason. They're not stupid, but they are lazy. Okay, they are lazy because within this, you know, pile of hay, there were a few, a few needles. But the only way to find out who the needles are is to actually go out and collect data on them and then track them going forward and see what happens. Now, if you looked at the P&L of Capital One during the time of this experiment, you would have seen that they were losing like boatloads of money because of all these, these deadbeats. And so Wall Street was like, these people are crazy, they're nuts, we gotta get rid of them, the CEO's a lunatic, you know, we gotta shut them down, et cetera. But they managed to hold out long enough to get the information, which enabled them, right, to come up with a scoring model that utilized information that wasn't available or hadn't, you know, the model that the other banks have was not sufficiently rich to make predictions about these people. Okay, so if you look at their P&L, how would you characterize all the money that they lost with all of those customers? Anybody here a bank accountant? Okay, or anybody remember accounting or do accounting, right? This is going to be a loan loss. This is bad credit. This is a write-off. It's going to be an expense in the period, right, in which you expect it to occur. However, the better way to think about it is as R&D. Right? You are investing money to acquire information that helps you to train up a better model. Okay? And the companies that are willing to spend money on data acquisition are the ones that are ultimately going to win in, in this game. Okay, So that's how they were able to expand their business, by adding more rows right, and more columns to their spreadsheet. Now, let's fast forward now. The kinds of information that you can get about your customer is so much richer than the kind of information you could get back in the day, right? We all know about how Amazon and Netflix, right, and everybody else use big data to provide recommendations to the customers. We all know about how Facebook and Google use all sorts of information about you to provide customized news feeds and customized, right, search results and so forth. So why shouldn't the banks do something similar? So what kinds of data could banks look at that doesn't appear in a typical FICO score, right? Typical FICO score, how many times were you late? Let me give you an example. Suppose you're coming out of Harvard Medical School or you know, Haas School of Business and you have a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt and you're 27 years old. What does your FICO score look like? It doesn't actually look that great and yet, would you bet on this person? I'd bet on this person. If you want a job, come talk to me. I, I, I'm interested in hiring you, OK? Because you, know, you have a ton of human capital, which doesn't show up on your FICO score. So there's a company called SoFi, Social Finance. The way it got started was saying, hey, there are all these, I'm sorry, Stanford MBAs 
and they asked right, the student loan people, how many of these Stanford MBAs ever default on their student loans? And they're like, well, you know, we did have a guy who died. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> and, and he didn't pay off the loans. And so it's like, all right. So unless you're, you know, I mean, executive MBAs, you got to worry about the, yeah, sorry, guys. I mean, 30-year <laughs> loan, maybe not. But <clears throat> for the full-time MBAs, I think we can bank on, you know, 30 years of, of lifespan, right, where they can pay this thing off, all right? They're not going to, unless they go join an ashram or something and disappear off the face of the earth, they're going to pay off. That's, I guess, more of a Berkeley issue than a, <laughs> a Stanford Stanford issue, okay, but why isn't human capital incorporated into this model? Okay, what other kinds of information, right? So look, Netflix knows that standard classifications, you know, that they use in the media business like males, 24 to 36, that's so crude, that's so stupid, that is so 1970s, right? We could do segmentation down to the individual level and identify the credit risk of an individual based on individual characteristics. So all of these FinTech startups are looking for new ways to evaluate credit. Okay, you've seen some of them out there. Okay, they're not all around still. A lot of them have failed. A lot of them have been acquired and so forth. You know, what do they do? These are peer-to-peer. -peer. They call them peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. They're not really peer-to-peer -peer in the sense that you think. What they are are algorithmic lenders. They're lenders that use, right, a platform that in integrates and assesses different types of information and gives the lenders the ability to use different types of information to evaluate the credit risk. And then, you know, have a partner bank that does uh, much of, of the lending. So what about, for instance, location data? <clears throat> location data is used by Facebook to do advertising. This is one of my days last summer, right? And I, and I was at Facebook headquarters, and they said, oh, yeah, we've got this feature, whatever. I think it was two summers ago. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, let me check it out. So I looked up. This is me one day starting off at Haas, you know, going down to, you know, anybody who's ever commuted to the valley, you know about this little dog leg that, you know, <laughs> that weighs off and sends you in weird places. And then here I am, right? I'm at LinkedIn headquarters. Uh, I'm at uh, um, uh, Google headquarters, uh, Facebook headquarters. You know, I had lunch over uh, here, and I had, you know, I was hanging out here in the afternoon. And then I went to K&L Wine Merchants. Spent some time shopping. Okay, now if you're a bank, what do you think? Oh, that's an interesting piece of information. Could be good. I mean, KNL does. Send, you'd want, maybe want to know: Are they buying the good Bordeaux? Or are they buying the you know the, the the cheap one? I don't know. Maybe that's a valuable piece of information. Okay, maybe this guy's got a drinking problem. Who knows, right? Like this could be, <laughs> this could be important information. Okay, then boom. Uh, okay, the guy spends a couple hours at the opera house. Ooh, well, is that good or bad? Do opera goers default? with a higher probability or a lower probability. I don't know, but I bet it's different from the average person controlling for everything else. Why not incorporate that into our lending model? Now look, there are regulations that tell you what you can and cannot incorporate, but the amount of information in your Facebook profile, your LinkedIn profile, is profound, right? Here's a startup in Africa that is using location data from your cell phone and activity in your cell phone to give credit to people who have no credit history, because most people in Africa have no credit history, but they do have digital footprint and digital crumbs that are everywhere, okay? So really interesting insight. What about your personality, your big five personality profile? You guys know about this? Okay, so conscientiousness is one of them. People who are conscientious, all else being equal, tend to default at lower probabilities. So how do I know what your big five personality profile is? I could ask you, are you conscientious? <laughs> oh yeah, heck yeah, Mr. Banker, yeah. Adapt then why are you 20 minutes late for the meeting? Oh, well, you know, uh, whatever, okay. How do we know what your big five personality profile is? How would you find out? You could ask somebody's friends, you could ask somebody's family. You know what, they are not very good at assessing your personality. You know who's really good at assessing your personality? Cambridge Analytica, no, Facebook, <laughs> right? And I'm not joking about Cambridge Analytica, right? So if I take a look at your, your, your Facebook profile, and agreeableness is one of the big five, okay? If you, if you, if, if you well, Nietzsche, okay? Sun Tzu, these people, low agreeableness, okay? Maybe you have some friends who have liked, I hate everyone, okay, not agreeable, 
okay? Uh, Book of Mormon, agreeable, okay? It's a funny play, all right? I don't know. So, how do they know this? Because they've asked people at Cambridge, actually. Cambridge did this, real Cambridge, not Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> Right? They actually asked people to fill out these very extensive surveys and then looked at their Facebook profile and matched them. And your Facebook profile does a better job, the algorithm does a better job of predicting your big five than every other person in your life except for your spouse. <laughs> Think about that. That's pretty amazing. Okay? So this is the site that was used, the research site at Cambridge, which has been used by a lot. Now, let me give you another example. So there's a site called Prosper. At Prosper, in addition, when you apply for a loan, in addition to right, uh, answering all the questions about your income and so forth, and they ask you to fill out a little essay. Why should we lend you money? Free form answer. You can write anything you want. Now, do you think that the words contained in that have predictive value? Well, we can just simply add that to our model and see if it adds value. It turns out it does. You can do text analytics, right? Just like the words contained in an email are predictive of whether or not they're spam. You know, you see the word Nigeria? Spam, right? <laughs> Unless you're in the oil industry, I don't know, right? So, what do you think of these words? Which of these words <coughs> are more likely to correlate with a borrower who is going to pay you back in the free form essay? What do you think? Of course, if people, if everybody knows this, you know, you can write a little book, How to Get a Loan on Prosper. Make sure you include these words, right? And, you know, dating sites do this, right? Job application sites say do this. Right? So it's going to probably not work after a while. But this study was published in 2016. Which words do you think correlate? Just take a look. These ones. The other ones have negative correlation. So if someone says... I promise I will pay you when I get out of the hospital. So help me God. <laughs> Do not lend to that person. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> they are not going to repay you. Okay? Now, why? I don't know. Like, who cares? That's an answer for the psychologist. This is data scientists are just looking for correlations. Now, Look, still, all we're talking about is fairly simple data you know, that can fit in a spreadsheet. But of course, big data is about all sorts of other things right, that we could potentially use. Right? Like maybe uh, you know, when we use deep, deep learning or when we use neural networks, the models get very sophisticated. And so rather than using like, regression, you're doing something much more complicated. So how do I tell, for instance, the difference between a cat and a dog? <coughs> I basically start by having a bunch of humans go cat, dog, cat, dog, cat, dog, cat, dog. So I could do the same exact thing with a bank. I could have a bunch of loan uh, right, uh, evaluators, credit risk evaluators come in, look at these very sophisticated, complicated profiles, go approve, approve, don't approve, don't approve, don't approve. And then I just extract from their brain whatever it is that they're doing, OK? And then uh, I don't need to really understand it. I just need to know that I can replicate it. And that's what we're doing here, right? With neural nets, you just have the images of the cats and the dogs. People go cat, dog, cat, dog, cat, dog, boom. And then you no longer need the people. Use that as your training data to generate a scoring model. OK, so you probably know this best from Silicon Valley, <clears throat> the TV show. If you are interested in learning about the valley, uh, and from your outside the area, I always tell people, just don't bother to take a class. Just watch this show. <clears throat> You'll save a lot of money. Sorry, Julie. I, I didn't mean to steal any business from executive education. But you know, this TV show is free, and it's really, really good. And this guy, Jin Yang, came up with the hot dog, not hot dog <laughs> classifier. It's actually very good, very accurate. And you can access it for free on the App Store, OK? Uh, and so what else can we use this kind of? Neural net for, right, or deep learning? What about MRIs? We have doctors that spend all their time looking at MRIs, like cancer, no cancer, cancer, stroke, no stroke, stroke, no stroke. Why do we need the doctors? We don't. We just have to observe the doctors for a while and then fire them all, <laughs> right? Because we can replicate whatever's happening inside their brains. It's not that complicated. And it's actually going to be more accurate, and it's going to learn better. And we're, that's why we're seeing all of this talk of AI and the robots replacing 
the humans, and indeed, we should expect at some point that our surgeries will be done uh, by robots, and I don't see why bankers are any more important than surgeons. Okay, so we now talk about robots taking over the world's finance jobs, right? Uh, banking sector, ground zero for job losses from AI and robotics, right? Technology will cut 30% of bank jobs, says former Citibank CEO, <coughs> Fikrit Panda. Deutsche Bank wants to replace employees with robots. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, this sounds great. This sounds wonderful. If we could rid the world of the bank, of the, if we could rid the world of bankers, next stop, lawyers, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm also a lawyer, so I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't want to get completely replaced. <coughs> so, do you think it's possible that at some point we will be able to completely eliminate the profession, which has made so many of our alums uh, happy and wealthy and so forth? That, you know, really think? Well, deep learning will never be able to completely replace the human. There will always be role for human uh, judgment. And just to sort of confirm that, we can see examples. <laughs> <coughs> right? The machine is not there yet. Your two-year-old would never try to eat a chihuahua. I mean, maybe yours would, I don't know. But like, we have brains that are way more sophisticated than anything we have, have yet. Or, you know, like no one's going to throw a puppy <laughs> into the fryer. OK, so we're still not completely there yet. Now, this is funny, but there's also some dark examples of how things like bias can get baked into algorithms uh, and so forth. Uh, <coughs> this is a, a, so Google auto tags all these photos. I love this. A close up of a hillside next to a rocky hill tags. Giraffe! <laughs> Where's the giraffe? <laughs> I spent hours looking at this, trying to figure out where is the giraffe? Am I the idiot? Or is Google the idiot? Right? Or, or this one, a group of orange flowers in a field. So these are sheep with little orange sweaters on them. Because the, the algorithm has never seen, right, orange sheep. So if it's orange and it's in a field, it has to be a flower. And this is one of the reasons why, for instance, venture capital will probably never, right, be completely automated. <clears throat> now, when we're talking about run-of-the-mill kind of borrowers out on the street. Yeah, great. But again, novel situations are, are going to require humans. I love this one. Right? Anybody know about these goats that live in the trees? Well, Google doesn't. I didn't know about it until I saw the picture. And I was like, wow, goats and trees. Google looks at it and says, giraffes. They love giraffes for some reason. I don't know. OK? All right. So investment bankers may not, you're, some of you out there, your jobs are still, are still safe. OK? Uh, now, what about at the corporate lending side? OK, this is where things are really interesting. Right, because you know, corporations generate so much more information even than individuals. Now, they might not have Facebook profiles, but you know what they have? They have sales data. They have lead data. They have inventory data. They have receivables data. They have payables data. Right? They have payroll data. They have so much data. And then what do banks do now? They go to a company and they say, give me your quarterly financials. What the hell is wrong with that? Quarterly financials? Quarterly financials? Like when you walk outside and you're trying to figure out whether or not to bring a raincoat, do you look at the quarterly weatherly report from March 31st? No. Right? You want to know what it is right now. And so what banks are now going to do, and this is what the wave of the future is, they're going to simply plug directly into your enterprise software, get real-time data on all of your financials. Right? We're not going to have CFOs pulling all-nighters at the end of the quarter. They're just going to like push a button and print a snapshot of wherever the company is, and the banks are going to do exactly the same thing. So we're going to see real-time interest rates, real-time credit lines that are built on real-time financial data, which you can get from the enterprise software. Now, I mentioned banks, but really, why do we need banks at that point? Who's got access to the data? The enterprise software companies. So we need to look out as those guys as potential competitors if, if we're banks. OK, what about insurance? <clears throat> well, same thing. Every single truck in America now has some form of telematics in use. Why? Because 
not only do we want to know where all of our goods are, we want to know where all of our trucks are. Now, if we know where they are, we also know how they drive. We know right, how fast they're going. We know whether the driver is a good driver or a bad driver. We know if they're getting sleepy and they're veering off the side of the road. So we can use this data not just to sort of provide guidance, but also to price the risk. Right? So if I have a fleet of trucks, and I know how many are on the road and how they drive and what their contents are, then I, as an insurance company, know exactly right, the probability of a bad event and <clears throat> right, the magnitude of the loss should it occur. And that model is continually getting updated because whenever an event does occur, it gets fed into right, my uh, data set in, in the cloud. So at the end of it, and again, a lot of the stuff that we talk about in FinTech is at the consumer level. My point is that most of the stuff that's really exciting is actually on the enterprise level. So you as an individual, uh, there's a company started here in uh, the information school. It was called Automatic. And what they manufactured was a little dongle that you could jam into your car if it was built any time in this century. And it will, through your phone, tell you right, how fast you're driving and how well you're driving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and you could provide this data to your insurance company. So if you drive, right, fewer miles than the average, you shouldn't pay the average. If you drive more safely than the average driver, you shouldn't pay the average. Now, what do insurance companies do now? They say, you know, look at your police report. You know, did you get caught speeding? Now, getting caught speeding is not very highly correlated with speeding even, much less anything else. And so that's crappy data. What we want is real-time data that's accurate. Okay, telematics can provide that to us. And so insurance companies are asking for this type of data. And so I've made this point before, but <clears throat> at some point, we will be able to see our insurance rates vary in real time. So you know, as you start driving, right, uh, in a, badly, you know, you're sleepy, you haven't had your coffee, and you're driving like an idiot, you can see your insurance rates go up. In, in real time, saying, hey, you know, pull over, take a nap. Now, of course, if you're driving to Vegas, yeah. <coughs> something else might happen, right? Other insurance prices might be impacted. OK, well, what about health insurance? <coughs> this is a company that I visited in South Africa many years ago, Discovery Health. And what they said is, we can provide a much better assessment of your health risk if we have access to things that are predictive of your health status, right? So right now, what does a health insurance company do or a life insurance company do? They ask your age, you know, your, your gender, your marital status, you know, et cetera. And that's, that's really crude. What would they really like to do? Would they really like to poke a hole in you and take your blood and all this other kind of stuff, right? But what else could they do? If you exercise, or if you eat right, those things should impact your expected health care liabilities, or at least be correlated with your expected health care liabilities. Okay? So how can they track that? They can either ask you to self-report, or they can ingest data from other sources. Right? So all we're talking about is adding more columns to our model. So what they did, and they did this 25 years ago, was they asked you if you join a gym to give them access to your gym data. So you go in, you swipe the card, right, you know, and that goes pshoop, right back to the insurance company. You know, she went to the gym. Now, of course, you know, you could just like leave right after that. <laughs> but, you know, once you're there, you might as well do something. What about the food that you purchase, right? You know, you go to Whole Foods and you buy pshoop, kale, you know, it's like, all right. Pshoop. So, by the way, just pay cash for the bad stuff, you know, <laughs> right? There's, there's, there's ways that you can. <laughs> There's ways that you can uh, you know, game this, right? But what they found was that people who participated in these programs right, had dramatically better healthcare outcomes. And so they're able to offer them insurance premium discounts. And so all the healthy people in all of South Africa flocked to Discovery Health. And this helped them to become very profitable. Now, furthermore, they realized that there's high degrees of correlation between your health and your driving behavior. People who buy kale tend to also drive really well, OK? <laughs> You know, people who buy, I don't know, you know, potato chips and beer, you know, maybe they don't drive so well. Okay, so we actually they were actually able to adjust driving prices and life insurance prices based on the information they have. So look, when you have lots of information, this also allows you to go into multiple product verticals as a financial institution. Okay, and so there was an insurance company in England that wanted to look at your Facebook profile 
to adjust your insurance rates, and this created some fluff and, and some, you know, some, some controversy and so forth, as you might imagine. But people seem to be willing to share this data, including their exercise data. How many of you have Fitbits? <clears throat> now, if you're an insurance company, wouldn't it be great to know what's going on with that Fitbit? So I have a friend who signed up for one of these policies. Uh, you know, there's, there's these companies out there that, that say, you know, give us access to your Fitbit data. So I know this friend of mine, he actually signed up for this thing. And then he uh, took his Fitbit and he put it on his dog. <clears throat> And he went to the dog park, had the dog run around, and he said, smoking a cigarette, you know. <laughs> so look, big data doesn't always mean accurate data. You gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta worry about uh, this, this sort of thing, right? But look, you know, healthcare institutions, they want to know if you comply. Look, if you're on an $80,000 a year hepatitis uh, treatment plan, you know, we want to know if you take the pill, okay? And if you don't take the pill, then we're going to have to run you through another one of these things next year. So how do we know if you take the pill? They have connected pill boxes, right? You open up the pill box, and then beep, doctor gets a message. A lot of times, if you have a senior citizen parent who's a little, you know, whatever, you need to find out, are they taking their medicine? This thing will tell you. But you still don't know if they swallowed it. I mean, they could be like, <laughs> where'd that pill go, right? And, and, and that's me, actually. Uh, and <laughs> so what we really want is a pill that tells you if it's been swallowed. And we have that now, right? It, it does ingestion detection, OK? And remember, everything is going to be connected sooner uh, or later. OK, what about investment management? How many of you use robo-advisors? OK, look, I mean, I've been teaching in financial engineering for a long time, algorithmic trading, program trading, right, at the institutional level through high frequency and through, like, you know, long short equity uh, stuff and, you know, global macro. A lot of that stuff has been automated. But at the retail level, we're now starting to attract individuals to these, these robo-advisors like personal capital, like Wealthfront and Betterment. Now, I've always been puzzled because I learned back at my you know, business classes in 1990 you know, or 88 or whatever it was, you know, how to do mean variance portfolio optimization. I know some of you just like got shivers, like, oh, Jesus, I thought I'd put that behind me, right? But it's like Harry Markowitz invented this stuff back in the day. It's like a little standard deviation, a little mean. He's already, he's like, Ugh, don't call on me. Right? Covariances, you know, correlations. This is easy math. OK, this is not that hard. Why do we pay people you know, 100 or 200 basis points to do the kind of math that a smart eighth grader can do? I don't know. Because I could do that with a couple lines of code. Now, look, you know, what you really want is you have some salesperson come in, nice tie, oh, I'm taking care of you. I'm making sure you're safe for your retirement, blah, 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 right? You want to give 300 basis points to that clown? No. Maybe you are that clown. I don't know. Like I say, when people come to me and they want to learn finance, I say, look, don't even take any finance classes. Just take a marketing class. Because that's what you really need if you want to be a financial advisor, OK? <laughs> Because now, right, if you're a financial advisor, you can forget about the kids taking over the business with you because they don't want this nonsense. They want to let the machine do the trading for them, OK? But these models, Betterment, Wealthfront, et cetera, they're extraordinarily, they're extraordinarily simple. They're not very complicated. You know, you talk about Facebook, and you talk about Google, and et cetera. Those are complicated data science initiatives. What does Wealthfront do? What does Betterment do? It's basically like 60, 40, you know, a couple ETFs. It is not that, like I said, a few lines of code. Now, what you really want to do is start incorporating, you know, information about the individual customer, okay, so that every customer has their own unique portfolio that matches up not only with their individual preferences and attitudes towards risk, which you can't get from a simple survey, Best way to find out someone's attitude towards risk? Banks now ask you, how much risk do you like? That's like the dumbest question ever, right? Look at their Facebook profile. If they say, I love bungee jumping, OK, boom. That answers the question much better <laughs> than asking someone face to face. OK, so we want to know about your risk, but we also want to know the rest of your portfolio, because your taxable account is such a small chunk of your portfolio. So I have a cousin, he works at Apple. He's got most of his money in Apple. 
He's got a house in Los Gatos, right, and he works at Apple. So human capital, real estate, financial portfolio, highly correlated. Even if he had S&P 500, which he would like to have, right, pure S&P 500, he's still not diversified because his house and his human capital are tied to Silicon Valley ecosystem, okay? Do any of these incorporate that? No, of course not, because we don't know what the mean variance characteristics are of human capital as an asset drilled down to individual SIC codes or company levels, okay? But now we're starting to collect that kind of data, and that's what these companies will be able to do. Segment all the way down to one, right? Like Facebook, like Amazon. Okay, now what about capital raising? Okay, we have an alum, a couple of alums who created this wonderful site called Indiegogo Kickstarter. These were originally designed to help finance films and so forth. Now they're being used to finance companies, okay, as you may know. Now, originally this was, the idea was you can uh, get some rewards or you can prepay for your product, but now you can also access equity, okay? You can now access equity through these platforms, sometimes called peer-to-peer -peer platforms, enabled by uh, the Jobs Act. And so there are some famous examples of companies that have been started with crowdfunding for products and rewards, like the Pebble smartwatch, but this pales in comparison with what we're seeing in ICOs, which are effectively a way for companies to jumpstart by selling either tokens, which are like kind of products, or uh, equity, which is being shut down by the SEC. <clears throat> the crazy thing is that last year there was more money raised in certain quarters to ICO issuance than all the venture capital funding across the board. This is probably going to go away, but amazing what happened here. And it was enabled because of this crowdfunding. We'll talk a little more about that. Finally, payments. Payments is usually the first thing you think about when you think about innovation in fintech because it's the one that you encounter pretty much every day. So, right, what is payment? Payment is transferring value, okay? Transferring value from one person to the other, and usually what you do is you do it through some kind of payment system, right? And there are lots of different payment systems out there, credit cards, checking, you know, cash is a payment system, wire transfer, and so forth. Now, let me give you financial innovation in a microcosm. Again, I study financial history, I watch it happen, in real time. Do you remember the days when you used to write a lot of checks? Okay, I remember, I love talking to alumni because they actually remember some of the things I remember. <laughs> you know, you know, like uh, cable TV and stuff like that, right? <clears throat> or like, you know, desktops and things. So it's, it's great. I remember I used to write a whole bunch of checks. Now the way this would work is you'd go and you'd give somebody a check in a store, and the check that that person received, they would give it to their bank, and then their bank would have to somehow get it to my bank so that my bank could get it back to me. And at the end of the month, I'd get an envelope with a stack of checks. Does anybody remember actually getting a packet of, like, big fat envelope full of checks at the end of the month? I was telling my students about this, they're like, what? <laughs> And they're like, Professor, why do checks bounce? And I said, well, back when I was young, they were made out of rubber. <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah. Right. Like, yeah right. You can tell them anything, right? They, they don't know, right? One of my students asked me, I was talking about when I was, I was assigned the Rubik's Cube uh, in college as a weekend assignment. And one of, my, one of my students was like, why didn't you just Google it? <laughs> I was like, like, they don't remember a time before Google. It's kind of amazing, right? Okay, so this physical check had to make this journey to a clearinghouse, right? And the clearinghouse might be, for instance, somewhere where, the, you know, at the Fed. And then that check would, you know, they would all come together and there'd be someone who would be like with a little, you know, visor entering all the data and like clearing everything uh, back and forth, okay? And so a lot of data entry had to take place. Now, because of this huge volume of checks, when I was in school, Citigroup used to actually have uh, put the checks in these big sacks and fly them to Ireland, where you know people in Ireland overnight would enter all the data, and then the checks would fly back in the morning back to New York. Okay. Now, if you were trying to figure out how to make this process kind of more efficient, what would you do?
Why do you have to actually move the checks around? Why can't we simply move the data around? Well, the data has to be entered. How do we enter it? Well, why don't we send, instead of write checks to Ireland, because Ireland used to be low wage back in the day, why don't we send them pictures of checks and they can enter? And then we can send it to India where it's even cheaper. And then they can enter the data from the images. But then we can apply OCR and we can get rid of the Irish and the Indians, right? Okay? But again, the first step is you have to make it possible for the images to circulate and not just the checks. So there's a technological piece, there's also a legal piece because there's what's called payment systems law where a negotiable instrument right, has to actually be present. And so they need to change the law so that an image could be a negotiable instrument. Okay? Now, of course, you can essentially pay with a check and the clearing, right, and the registry, all that stuff happens almost immediately because they can scan the check, scan the data at the point of sale. And now when you get a check, do you take it down to the bank and deposit it? No, you take a picture of it and you deposit the picture of the check and not the check itself. Now, as a consumer, this is what you see. You're like, oh, wow, FinTech revolution. Like, I get to put my check in with a camera on my phone. <coughs> But this came after, long after, on the back end at the institutional level, right, you have the institution, you have the legal and the technological stuff happening. Okay, that's where all the big money is, not at the level of the consumer. So how do banks make money? One of the ways they make money is by moving money. Okay, by moving money. And where do they make the most money? You know, we think about things like checks and cash, but in reality, the vast volume of this is in wire transfers. This is an incredibly sophisticated and yet archaic system that banks use to move their money around. These are all the different ways, right, in terms of uh, payments, non-cash payments that you see uh, at the consumer level, right? And there have been a lot of disruptions in payments. And the question is, is this sector about to get majorly disrupted by this thing we call uh, the blockchain? Now, before we get to blockchain, you know, people think, oh, I know, payments have been disrupted because we now have you know, Google Pay and Apple Pay, which is amazing, right? You, know, you just go in, ching, and pay, and so forth. Okay? And even Starbucks has gotten into the act, and I can pay with my Starbucks app. Now, how many of you think this is disruptive innovation? This is not disruptive innovation. Okay, this is not disruptive innovation because all of these payment systems are still working through this open loop, these rails, which include the transaction acquirer, the issuer processor, and then this intermediary, right? It has to go through this system, the same system that it did before. So when we think about like, you know, Apple Pay, this is like, you know, saying, wow, this is so transformative. I have a motorized mounting block that enables me to get on my horse easier. <laughs> okay? Not exactly transformative, because you're still using the same pipes. You're still using the same intermediaries. You're still using the Visa and the MasterCard system, right, to make those payments. Now, of course, there's going to be negotiation over, you know, who gets the bigger piece of the pie and so forth and so on. And there's also quite a bit of data capture that can happen at the point of sale. So companies like Square, for instance, they're actually collecting data, right, every time somebody makes a transaction. Square makes no money on those transactions. Why do they do this? To get the data they can then use, right, to provide other services to the, the, the merchants that they work with. So now, of course, Square is getting into lending. And that's because when these small, if I go, if I have like a, a you know, Vietnamese uh, ban me uh, truck out on Bancroft and they go into a bank and they ask for a loan, the bank will be like, yeah, right. They go to Square and Square sees, oh, you're selling like 3,000 bon mis a day. You know, sure, like we'll give you some money, okay? Because again, they have now access to a whole column of data that the banks can't see. Okay? Okay, so when do things get really disruptive? They get really disruptive when you disintermediate that payment system that sits in the middle, okay? Where you have, right, a closed system. 
Now, PayPal is kind of like that. If I Venmo you some money, <clears throat> as long as you keep it in your PayPal account, your Venmo account, and you don't try to turn it back into your bank account, then that's just sloshing around in the Venmo system. It never has to go through right, Visa or MasterCard. Now, that's still a pretty small percentage of transactions now, but where in the world is this taken off? China. China. Alibaba and Tencent are more disruptive than pretty much any company in the United States in the financial services sector, in the consumer financial services sector. Okay? And if we look at the number of mobile payments happening, in China, you almost can't pay with cash. They laugh at you. Right? I mean, if you go to buy like a stick of gum of some merchant, in fact, if you go to a, a, a beggar on the street, <laughs> they'll be like, WeChat. <laughs> you know? They'll, they'll only take WeChat if you want to pay, you want to help out some poor beggar on the street. They look at you, you show up with cash to be like, <laughs> you know, who are you, right? <laughs> Tourist, you know? <laughs> right? So, you know, take a look. This is the amount of mobile payments happening in China compared to the United States. And that blue line, that includes, right, Apple Pay and Google Pay, right, and all the things that many of you guys use. I mean, this is just completely night and day, okay? And if you look at the, the amount of what the merchant pays for this, okay, it is nothing compared to what you have to pay with some other products. And so this is, now what this does is now, right, if I'm, if I'm Alibaba, I have all this information, right, from all the merchants. And that means that I now can assess the credit quality of that merchant better than any bank, okay? And if I can get that merchant to purchase its supplies from a supplier using Alipay, then I have all this information about the merchants. And now I can back out, right, the inventory levels of, of that company, right? And then if I have all my consumers buying it, I know how much money they spend. If I know how much money you spend, then I have a good assessment of what your credit quality is. So they're building out these financial superstores, you know, the fantasy of the bank in the 90s, and they're doing it built on better data than anybody else has. You know, when Armageddon happens in China and all the banks go belly up, Tencent and Alibaba will be left standing over the, the dust because they have the best data in all of China. Okay, now we even in Kenya have something like M-Pesa, right? And this is more sophisticated than most of the things that you use, okay, when you make payments. Okay, here in the US. And so who needs to watch out, right? The banks need to watch out for companies here in the States, like Amazon, which is already in the business, although currently in partnership with banks. Now, the most disruptive potential technology for payments is, is Bitcoin. Why? Potential, I said. Why? Because it doesn't have to go through anybody. This is actually a pure peer-to-peer transfer of funds. I don't have an Alibaba. I don't have a Tencent. I don't have a Venmo. I don't have a Visa, MasterCard, Chase, or anybody. It's just you and me, we transfer value. Okay, so if the internet was all about transferring information, right, the blockchain or Bitcoin is meant to be about the transfer of value on, online. Now, I, I could do a whole lecture on, whole course on, on, on cryptocurrencies, and I won't, but just this is why everyone was so excited because you disintermediate everybody. So this is the promise. The world's biggest bank with no actual bank, no cash. So Bitcoin has the promise of being the Airbnb, the Facebook, the Uber of payments. Okay, And this is one of the reasons why there's so much investment in the blockchain space, because of this potential. Okay, And the idea is that we do not have some central trusted authority. Now, in reality, of course, everyone puts their Bitcoin into a wallet, in which case means you're bringing back banks and so forth, more or less. Uh, but we'll just forget about that for now <clears throat> and try to figure out where the applications here are. Now, if you are not a drug dealer or a tax avoider, why would you use this? Because at the end of the day, it still is pretty darn cheap to use the current system here in the US. Right? Not that complicated. You, you get a pretty good value, anti-fraud, all this other stuff, which you don't get with Bitcoin. Okay? Uh, you can reverse transactions. I don't think Bitcoin will ever replace anything here in the US domestically. The bigger opportunity might be internationally. Think about remittances. People pay their relatives back in other countries. 
tons of money flowing from the US and other developed countries back to these developing countries. Okay, remittances is at the same level as FDI. Massive flows of cash. And how does it happen? It happens through the traditional banking system. Now, the traditional banking system, once you go across country boundaries, becomes extraordinarily expensive and fee-driven and, uh, and, and, and uh, slow. So this shows you, like, for instance, South Africa, the average cost of remitting money from South Africa, if you're a laborer there, is about 16.5%. That's insane, right? That's crazy. From Japan, 11%, okay? So this is an opportunity, potentially. And the reason why it's so expensive is because in order for me to transfer money, I have to go to my bank and somehow get the money into the bank account of someone in another country. <clears throat> Now, if those banks don't have accounts with one another, they have to go to another bank, which might have accounts with both banks. And if that bank doesn't have an account with both banks, then they have to go up another level, right? And so what you have are these interlocking balance sheets or ledgers. And each step of the way, you have to have a common banker who can move funds from one bank account to the other, just like the Fed, whenever a check would roll through the clearinghouse, would move funds from one bank account to the next. And so the more levels and layers you have to go through, not only do you have to pay fees right, and transaction costs because of the sterile balances that are sitting in these accounts, the liquidity that's needed to make it all work out, but you also have to wait till end of day for all the accounts to clear. So time is long. Payments are long, and so that's why everybody's like, look at this, Bitcoin, it's free, it's wonderful. Okay, sorry to disappoint you, but it's not gonna happen. Okay, it's not gonna happen. This is the promise of Bitcoin. A lot of startups in this area, I've met a lot of the founders, lots of promise. The problem is, Bitcoin is an issue. Bitcoin will never be a successful currency because it does not have the three fundamental characteristics you need for a currency, right? It has to be a good store of value, it has to be a good medium of exchange, it has to be right, a good unit of account. This shows you the volatility. Who wants to leave their money sitting in Bitcoin even for a couple days, unless you're a, one of these you know, speculators you, you see at a meetup, okay? Look at the volatility of Bitcoin. This is compared to the volatility of the pound, okay, and that's Brexit. I don't want my money in this, in this thing. What about unit of account? This is the price of a gallon of gasoline denominated in Bitcoin, okay? That's why nobody actually denominates anything in Bitcoin. When they say, we take Bitcoin, what's your price? Well, it's $6, right? And then you convert it back to Bitcoin. Okay, as a medium of exchange, the world's largest Bitcoin conference stopped taking Bitcoin <laughs> for registration fees, okay? And of course, the amount of energy that is needed. This is the Bitcoin, the amount of energy Bitcoin uses right now. It sits somewhere between Switzerland and Czech Republic. That's a lot of energy. And this means that you have to actually pay, right, for the energy that's consumed. So now, instead of being free, you actually have to pay transaction costs to get your transaction to the front of the queue. Otherwise, you might have to wait, right? And then you might even have to wait like an hour, two hours, three hours before you feel fully confident that that money has gone through. So look, the number of transactions that Bitcoin can handle, very, very small. And furthermore, you can't spend it. You send it back to your relative in Mexico, it's like, ooh, I got Bitcoin. And then you go into the store and you wanna buy right, some tortillas and they're like, you're gonna take Bitcoin. So you gotta get it back into pesos somehow. Okay, and so it's this movement in and out that's gonna cost you, and it's gonna cost you a lot more than simply running the money through a, a bank wire right, because of the spreads, just simple lack of liquidity. You know, so this is an actual transaction fee. If I go to a Bitcoin ATM and try to withdraw it in, in fiat money, I want to pay anywhere from 6 to 10%. And that's not including the spread, okay? So look, Western Union isn't going to go out of business anytime soon. They're going to adopt different technologies, okay? But this is where the big money is. It's not in remittances. It's in these business-to-business -business payments across border. And that's why we have these kinds of companies, like Ripple and Stellar. This is all about right, business to business, back end 
big volume transactions, which are currently you know, very expensive. So if we look at the payment system, they're not sitting at the like, you know, you're sending money back to your uncle, right? It is, right, at the bank level. So the banks are making transactions with other banks. Now, nothing's changed here. You're still doing something like correspondent banking, except now, because the data needs to move around more quickly than the money moves around, right, we can settle these things more quickly. So, the difference between a Bitcoin and a Ripple, in a nutshell, again, not too much time to elaborate, is that what Bitcoin uses is an open, permissionless, digital, I mean, distributed ledger system, right, where anybody can jump in and, and do a transaction. Right, that's kind of the beauty of it. I can go buy Bitcoin, you can go buy Bitcoin. We don't need to ask anybody's permission, and there's no middleman that can you know, accept or deny, approve or reject. It's distributed the consensus around validating these transactions. What's different about systems like Ripple and most of the blockchain systems that will prevail is that they are permissioned, meaning that you have to be you know, a member, and membership has its privileges. And so you have these different nodes, and the nodes basically know one another, okay? And then if I want to give money to my uncle back in, in, you know, uh, in, in France, let's say, then I have to go to one of these banks that are a member of the Ripple network, and then my uncle will go to one of these banks that's a member of the Ripple network, and then those banks will do their transacting through this distributed ledger, okay? Okay, so we've talked about payments very quickly using blockchain. What about other kinds of asset clearing and settlement? If you understand the logic, and I don't expect you would after that very brief description of how blockchain works for, for cash, once you understand that this will essentially buy giving everybody access to a single source of truth by facilitating right, the movement of assets or what we call the internet of value, why restrict it just to cash? Cash is actually a very, very small part of the economy. So this is how securities currently clear and settle. Extraordinarily complicated system, takes a long time. You've got a lot of different players. Okay, anybody who's participated in this world you know how all the different players, right? You have custodial agents, you know, you have the brokers, you have the exchanges, you have the regulators, all of them have their own ledgers, all of them have their own way of tracking the movement of these assets. I do a transaction, it might be cleared at the end of day, it gets settled, you know, a couple days later when the actual asset moves around. <clears throat> okay, we can lay waste to this whole thing, potentially, right, with distributed ledgers, okay? What about real estate? Okay, and again, the places where I think this will happen the most quickly are the ones that currently have the highest transaction costs right now, meaning the system right now has a lot of frictions, and the nature of the transaction is very simple. So real estate may have a lot of transaction costs, even though the assets aren't super simple. So in India, for instance, this is what it takes to transfer a title in India. And I pick India because India might actually potentially leapfrog the US in this regard. Uh, if all the players get together. This is what a title office looks like in India. Good luck trying to figure out who owns what, okay? Uh, and by the way, if you want to collect on a debt, on a mortgage or some other debt in India, good luck. You know, this is, makes Jarndyce versus Jarndyce look like a walk in the park, okay? Sue somebody in India and wait for 20 years just to get your first appearance before a judge, okay? That's very difficult. And it's not just the assets itself, it's really much more about the security interests, right? So in the US we call these Article 9 security interests. You know, where I will give you a loan and then you pledge some asset, whether it's real estate or a car or you know, business inventory or a factory or something like that, meaning that my rights in that asset are limited Okay, how do you keep track of this stuff now, right, with these liens? Oh, by the way, insurance, same thing. This is actually New York life. This is how they keep track of all their insurance policies, 
right, going back 100 years. Right, title insurance, it's a mess. I have a friend that's got a startup right now in title insurance. I remember when I sold my house in North Carolina, the buyer didn't you get a mortgage, so the buyer gave me a check for the whole property value. They didn't even know about my mortgage. Now, this is before Haas, but I guess this is why I got the job, but I got this check and I'm like, huh, the mortgage company will chase down the buyer when the payments stop coming in. Should I take the whole check or should I tell the buyer, hey, you forgot about the mortgage? What do you think? What would you do? <laughs> <clears throat> now, if you said you'd take the whole check, then we can revoke your degree <laughs> for a character violation, right? Of course, this, the reason why this lawyer didn't know that I had a mortgage on the property is because if you want to know about security interests, you've got to actually you know, go and, and do a lot of research. It's extraordinarily complicated, okay? And it's only partially digitized. Now, take this, take, take one mortgage, add it to a couple thousand mortgages, and then create a whole bunch of, you know, mortgage-backed securities. This is what you get, okay? This is a candidate for blockchain, okay? So look, what are contracts? Contracts are simply if-then propositions. If you do this, I'll do this. If you don't do this, I'll do that. Anybody know anything about computer code? Same thing, okay? And so what we really are looking at now, and the most exciting area, I think, for blockchain that I'm fascinated by is this idea of self-enforcing contracts, which I've been working on you know, intellectually for over 20 years, okay? This is an example of a self-enforcing contract, right, where you give two keys to the safe deposit box, no individual can access the box, right? Or the pirate treasure map, you rip it in half, and this forces cooperation. So this guy, uh, <coughs> Nick Svabo, wrote this article called Smart Contracts back in the 90s, probably one of the most influential articles that you've never heard of. And what he said is, you know, what if we could figure out a way to minimize the use of all these lawyers and get rid of a lot of this litigation and lawsuits? Now, first of all, you'll never happen. The lawyers will always have jobs. But the idea is, like, how do I create a contract that's like a vending machine? Vending machine is you go put the money in and the, the stuff comes out. Okay, and if they don't have stuff, they don't take your money. It's a contract, but you don't sign anything. Okay? So think about the repo man. If you understand this, by the way, if you understand this slide and they kick us out in a minute, you will learn everything you need to know about smart contracts. This is an Article 9 security interest. If you borrow money to buy a car, the lender has an Article 9 security interest in your car. They can repossess your car if you fail to pay, okay? They can use what's called self-help, okay? They don't need to sue you. They don't need to get the sheriff and so forth. They just hire the repo man. Now, the problem is the repo man has to find you. They have to find your car. They have to break into your garage. They have to, you know, mace your dog, okay? They have to do all sorts of things, which is why they're kind of unsavory. Have you seen the TV shows about the repo men? They're not savory people, okay? How could we eliminate the need for a repo man? Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to write a contract. As long as you make your payments, you get to drive the car. If you stop making the payments, you don't get to drive the car. Well, what if we just bake into the car an ignition which shuts down when the payments don't get made? Okay, that is a smart contract. Payment stops, car stops. Okay, so you're driving down the road, like, ooh, ooh, ooh better get home by midnight. You know? Make that payment. <laughs> it's like, no, pull over, dude. Make the payment from your phone, because you're not going to make it home. Right? OK? Cars that have these kinds of systems, people pay. People pay. Enforcement costs are much lower. And therefore, more people have access to credit that wouldn't otherwise have it. So the closest example I can think of in finance to a vending machine is an SPV, a special purpose vehicle. Essentially, it's a vending machine. Right, so what you have is you have money flowing in, money flowing out, right? So all the CDOs, CDO squared, right, SPVs, right, every kind of instrument you can think of is essentially a vending machine. It's on autopilot. If you want to make money without doing any work, become a trustee of an SPV. I have some lawyer friends that live in Hawaii. They're, S they're trustees for like 500 SPVs. They do nothing, okay, because everything is automated. 
Now, this is what it looks like. This is what the master agreement looks like. It's a dumb contract. And there are literally millions of master agreements for all these SPVs. Let's replace the dumb contracts with smart contracts. OK? If we do that, the if-then proposition is if the money hits the account, the money goes out of the account. It's all on autopilot. It's all on robo-pilot, OK? OK? And so obviously, you'll still need lawyers, but it's, it's pretty amazing. Now, if you went back to your core finance class, you may have learned about these Arrow Debreu securities. They're just essentially if-then clauses, if-then propositions. And where do you see them? This. If you're interested in blockchain and you want to make money, forget about sending money back to your uncle in France. This is where you should be thinking. This is the size of the entire economy of the world right here, GDP. This is the notional principle of all derivatives, OK? This, these are all forwards, futures, and options. And these are all derivatives except interest rate swaps. This right here, interest rate swaps. The biggest universe that most of you have never heard of. Millions of lawyers, millions of traders, millions of accounts. All that can be put on the blockchain, OK? And all this clearing system and settlement system, which we took, you know, Dodd-Frank is like this thick, this much of it has to do with clearing and settling of swaps. Okay, it's a, it's a nightmare, it's a mess. And we can take this whole system and simplify it with distributed ledgers. Okay, I won't talk about supply chain, but supply chain, you kind of get the idea, right? You got goods flow in. If I have inventory and I want to get financing for my inventory, I go to a bank or a lender, the minute the item comes in, the loan amount increases to match that inflow. The minute the item goes out, the loan amount drops. So that the financing of the supply chain mirrors exactly the movement of the goods through the supply chain. How do you do that? You do it with sensors, right? Sensors track the movement through the supply chain. So auditing, for those of you who work for big auditors, Deloitte, whatever, these guys, not the, well, not the consultants, but you know the, the auditors, EY, whatever, your job will no longer be to audit accounts. That whole business will be wiped out. Your job will be to audit the data inputs. Right? If I've got a sensor that tracks my inventory, you're going to go and take a look at that sensor and make sure there's no tape on it. That's your job, OK, to make sure that the data it comes in, it comes in authentic. Because after that, the way the data is stored, and the way it's distributed, that will not be an issue. OK, so we're starting to see these guys. So net takeaway, I started off with this circle of innovation. And we walked through kind of what's now traditional fintech, which you know is only 10 years old. OK, we walked through starting with Capital One, all the way forward, digitization of checks. Briefly touched on blockchain. People think blockchain is about payments, OK? And they think it's about potentially market provisioning. It's actually also about deposits and lending. In fact, it's going to be affecting every single part of this circle. Distributed ledger technologies, OK? Which are not the same as blockchain, which is not the same as crypto, which is not the same as Bitcoin. Think distributed ledger. Technologies. So thanks for coming in. Sorry, I'll stick around. I'll be here for lunch. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to, to discuss privately. <laughs>